Well, have you ever seen this before? No. Well, my husband is a very kind man. Um, I asked him if I could do something different tonight, and he said, Phil, it's your service. And so um, I said, well, then I'm going to do something different tonight. And so I've had this on my heart for quite some time. And uh, the reason I have Dave and Tom up here is because it's something that we deal with and talk about and work on continuously with people and families and stuff. And so I just want us to kind of interact and do some things. And I think it'll benefit you in things that we've had to deal with and discuss. And, and we'll just kind of get in the flow and you guys see if it helps you or if it doesn't help you, we'll never do it again. <laughs> Unless the Lord says so. There you go. How about that? Um, I was thinking about it. And um, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, you have school for everything under the sun. You have school to go to learn how to do everything. And they send us to school to do just anything you can think of. There's a internet course or there's a this course or there's a that course, but they really don't have a real parenting course. They got a lot of books out there, but they don't know what they're talking about, you know, because if they did, there wouldn't be so much trouble, you know, um, but there's really is, there really is a book and it's this book and it gives us the answers, but it doesn't give them to us in a one, two, three recipe like people like for it too. And so a lot of times people get confused, especially if you were reared in a home that took you to a denominational church or a church that was like ours that they didn't even give you a Bible all your life and you just had to hear what the priest said, you know, and take his word that that's what that said. And then you didn't even understand it because it was in Latin, you know. So um, you just had to take their word for it, you know. So uh, we didn't have a lot of input as far as these things. But we have learned through the years in pastoring a lot of do's and don'ts and a lot of things that help and a lot of things that don't. I guess this year will be how many years? 17. 17, 17 years pastoring. And so um, that's not as many as some, but it's not as few as some. But you do learn, how many of you have reared kids for 17 years? Have you learned anything? So we're going to kind of go from that angle and talk to you about some things. We're not going to be just say, turn to the scripture so you can put your Bible underneath your chairs. And we're just going to have kind of a conversation tone and, and kind of a talk tone. And as I was doing this, you know, people say, those teenage years, those teenage years, those teenage years, they're just horrible. Just wait till they get to those teenage years. Just wait. And the Lord showed me something just this week that I hadn't really thought about. And um, I thought, Lord, why, as much as I love youth, I hadn't ever even seen this because I was in youth for, I don't remember how many years, but lots of years. And, and most all of them still contact me. And, and, and so I'm still learning stuff, you know, even as they're in their young adult years. And a lot of them are married now with their own kids. But I said, why is it such a troubling time for them? What makes those years so difficult for them? And he gave me four things. And I thought, wow, God, you're so smart. You want to know what they were? Okay. When, when you turn, everybody, it's different. So I don't want to give a specific age. When you turn, say, some people 13, 14, 15, God has been working on you for your life. What he wants you to do and what you're thinking that you want to do. How many of you would think that that would be kind of so? Okay. But there's somebody else that's been working on you too. I'm going to go backwards up my thing here. Not only has God been working on you with a plan for your life, but the devil also has a plan for your life. And he's been working on you to get you to do a plan for your life. Then, not only does the devil has a, have a plan for your life, you have a plan for your life. You think, I want to do this. I can do this. I want to go here. I want to be this. I want to do this. 
then there's another plan for your life that's screaming and speaking really, really loud in your ears. Can anybody guess what that is? Your parents. Your parents. And they are a voice that you are very used to hearing. How many of you in here will be honest enough to say when you were 14, 15, 16, 17, your pa parents had one plan for your life and you had a totally different plan for your life. Raise your hand up real high. Yes, that's what I thought. And so we're not surprised by the fact that it begins to be a conflict there. Parents are wanting their kids to go one way. God's wanting them to go another way. The devil's wanting them to go another way and they're wanting to go another way. So there's four things that's happening in their life and teenagers are then like this table. They're getting long ways being pulled this way, short ways being pulled this way. And they are so confused with what they're supposed to do with their lives. And they haven't been brought up to properly hear from the Lord. So they don't know which voice to follow. They know they are supposed to honor and respect their parents. They know that. And that voice is real strong in their life. But they also know they have something else inside them. And they also know that flesh is screaming really, really loud. And the world or the devil is screaming really, really loud. So that's why you have so much teenage suicide, so many teenage problems, so many teenagers going on drugs, so many teenagers doing things. And we're going to get more into that here in, in a bit. Dave and I'll cut, touch some of that and maybe help on some of those scenarios. But we're going to start even younger than that so that we get to that point so that maybe it'll help you. I brought Tom up here tonight because what, what gets you to those places is you have... Um, influences all your life and those influences are what make you get to that point in your life they make you become who you are and when we started the church we were quite surprised at the things that the Lord had us do and the way he directed us to do some of the things that we were doing in the classes and stuff you'll get a kick out of this when the first service that we started the church in Branson at the Yellow Ribbon. Um, Dave was there and, and he had some people that he had helped us to get to sing and stuff like that. But we did not have anybody to work in the children's classes. So we had all of our staff that had come in from Branson to help us. And some of them had never changed a diaper before. So they said, I'll work with this crew, but please don't put me in with the babies with diapers because I've never changed one before. And so we had all of them spread out in the classes trying to teach the classes. And you would think it wouldn't be that big a deal except for the fact that we had over 500 people show up that day. And, and we had a bunch of babies and we had a bunch of kids and we had to have something ready for them to do. And so um, one of them showed a VeggieTales in their classroom and we got rebuked. And if you don't know what Veggie Tales is, it's a show that tells some of the Christian morals and good things, it's not bad stuff, but we got rebuked. Then another Sunday, we gave out prizes in the classroom to the one who won for saying their scripture verses and we got rebuked <laughs> because every child in the class didn't get a prize. So we were learning real quickly what we could and could not do. So we, we had to start begin sitting down some ideas and guidelines about what God said do and what, not what parents said do. So we had to get to the Lord about it because we had prayed about what was supposed to happen in the big service, but we didn't realize that kids was such a big deal. And we found out quite in a hurry that kids was a bigger deal than the big service. <laughs> because um, parents are quite into their children. Amen. And the children are a very much important, vital part of a church. Mm -hmm. And if the children's programs and the children's stuff is not correct, then the big service is not going to go right because the parents are not going to enjoy being in the big service because they're going to be wondering if their kids are being taken care of properly. And so... Um, 
we started getting some answers and stuff. And so I have Tom here, Tom and, and Amy. Amy, stand up. I'm not gonna leave you out. They've been with us basically since the beginning and they have been helping us and, and they left for like a year one time and Dave and I thought we were gonna pull our eyeballs and mm -hmm. our hair. That's why Dave has no hair. <laughs> Yeah, he had hair before, had hair before then, and they were gone for a year, and it was all gone after that. And um, we had to do some of their tasks, and, and we literally got on our faces and said, Lord, you have got to get them back. And I kid you not, he was at my door one night, and they were back. And uh, we have thanked God ever since that they were back. And Dave and I said, they're not going anywhere again. You do what it takes, you know. And, uh, but they have been working with the kids and they have great teams. It's not just them right. that, that do it. And, but they've trained a, a bunch of good people and they take Brother Moore's material that he teaches in the services. And it may not be this week or last week's material because it takes a little time to gather everything together, but they take what he teaches in the classes and they have a group of people that put the curriculum together and they write curriculum based on what Brother Moore has taught and teach it to the children and on their level. And so um, that being said, I have Tom here because I have a few questions for him. Would y'all like for me to put Tom on the spot? <laughs> they don't have a clue what I'm going to ask them. Should have brought some tissues up here. Yeah. We start sweating. Somebody They're in the, the hot seats, and you know me. I'm just liable to ask anything. So, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be good to them. But, um, um, Tom, when we first started the church, um, and we put the kids in there, what, what was the biggest problem that, that you saw with the parents and the kids, not just the kids, but the parents, when we had the kids and children's church, what was some of it? Well, you're, you're hitting on the first part, and that is parent challenges override sometimes kids' challenges. We always said that. We don't have as many kid issues as we have parent issues in the most loving parent way. But as we, I'm a parent, I'm a parent, I know this, I mean, I know this stuff. But as we get in, as we got started, it was structure and discipline. I would say it was one of the biggest things that we had to deal with and you not... You mean we couldn't beat them? Um, we, we, they didn't want us to say no or, you know, really much of any kind of discipline. A lot of, I think a lot of places babysit and so the kids kind of run things and, and as you've been around here very long, you know the kids don't run things. We don't run things. The Lord runs things through them and I know that the structure that we put in place is... is it's shocking to a lot of people as they come into the church, I think, because we require a lot of the kids from a very young age because we expect, we're expectors, and we believe kids rise to the expectations that are placed before them. And so if we expect peace in our classrooms and we expect them to, to learn the word and we expect them to, to come to class and be in their class with their peers, not with, not with siblings all the time, which was an issue. Which was at the a big issue beginning. because I think a lot of churches, you know, kids come and the four year olds in with the nine year old. And, and from the very beginning, you guys, you know, you were adamant that kids are going to learn by age. And so we rarely do that. I mean, and, and uh, rarely. Speaking, speaking of that, um, and try not to lose your train of thought on that, but we also had people that had physical and mental, what they, the world calls physical and mental handicaps. Um, mm -hmm. And I may not be saying it properly, uh, so forgive me if I didn't say something properly on that, but they, to where the doctors would tell them uh, they have the mind of a four-year-old, but they're actually nine years old, but they have the mind of a four-year-old. And what kind of difficulties did we run into that, and what did we tell them? We, well, we're faith people. Exactly. And if you're believing God for, the, for something to be normal, then we act as if it's normal. So four-year-olds don't go, go in the four-year-old class, and nine-year-olds go in the nine-year-old class. And that's a challenge for some parents because it's, it's putting action to words. It's not just having the faith. You're going to have to act on that faith when you bring them to, cl bring them to class. And we work with them. That doesn't mean that we just throw them in there and, and don't help them. If we, if we had to have somebody with them, I can think of several, but we had somebody sitting with those kids for a very long time. But over the course of time, children adapted. And I mean, I can't think of anybody over the, that lasted more than a few months at the most 
that we were sitting with or trying to get adapted. And you know, we don't call those things out. Right. When they come to the door, we don't say, what's wrong with them? What's happened with them? What's, what's their deal? They're, they're, our, they're children. They're our kids when they come through those yeah. doors. And I'm thinking of several instances where parents stayed in the church specifically because we didn't ask what was wrong with their kid. And they said, this is the first place we've come that people took them into class when we dropped them off and didn't ask what was wrong with them. And that's because we're, we're hooked faith. If you bring your kids here, we're hooking faith with you for the healing or hooking faith with you for whatever it is you're believing for. Yes. And we're going to treat them as healed. We're going to treat them as normal. And I use that in quotes because um, I learn a lot from those kids sometimes more than I do from the other kids. And, and how many of those kids would you say, I know basically how many we've had, but how many of those kids would you say uh, begin to see immediate changes that they were rising up to the nine-year-old level oh, instead absolutely. of saying at the four-year-old level? There's a huge difference. And we have these kids twice a week. Uh -huh. I mean, we're talking about Friday and Sunday. So they're not and here for... And just Sunday. And sometimes just one service out of those two. But bringing them in and putting them in class, you begin to see those kids rise up. And you also see the other kids loving on them and treating them as an equal. And it changes these kids. And you begin to see that uh, it's not so much the kids holding them back sometimes. It's, it's parents who, with, with all the love and the best intentions, um, want to protect them. But they, the kids help each other. Exactly. And we've seen healings come out of that. We've seen kids that weren't going to be uh, communicative ever, uh, nonverbal, that began to speak to us and began to have actions for things and began to ask for things. So, you know, even if a parent comes in today and wants to give us, we don't need all the information. We just need enough to know what, well, how old are they? What class are they going to go in? But that is a challenge sometimes because people, it's hard, not for the child. Because you see the child, you see back to the, you know, separating kids. You see the, the eight-year-old who's always with the three-year-old at home. And they're staying there almost going, no, no, I don't want to go to class. They don't want them to go to class with me because they need that break too. And on that same note, the parents of these kids that the world calls different, um, they need to be in service and be fed. Exactly. And so we began to see that. And I think that's one of the things that, we be, that you taught us from the very beginning is these parents need that as much as the kids need it. Now, and, and to explain, so in case somebody didn't understand that, we don't just dump them in there. We have an individual person that stays with that person right. and watches over them, that they're protected, and, and they're speaking the word over them, and they're praying over them, and they're making sure that they're interacting with the other kids properly. Right. They're not just dumped in there and, and no. uh, left to themselves and no. stuff. So They're not but, sitting in a corner alone. No. They're loved just like the other kids and, and treated like the other kids, and they rise to the expectations that exactly. we have for the kids. So. Yes, and so in, in saying these things, you understand what he's saying. You can't, you can't uh, we, we learn by mistake that parents would stand there and say, I want my three-year-old going in with my nine-year-old, and I want my nine. Those were some of the mistakes that we made in the beginning. Now, changing the subject just a little bit, you have um, uh, two boys of your own. Mm -hmm. Yes. And are the, these, you know them both very I well. I know them both very well. <laughs> Now, are these two boys' personalities the same? Completely different. So, in order for them to grow up and accomplish what God wants them to do, should they be allowed to do completely different things in order to reach what God has called them to do? That's a big question right there. Um, well, I can speak for us, parenting. It was different parenting Jonathan over it was parenting William. Their, their, the approach to discipline was different, but we had discipline. Mm -hmm. Do you, yes. uh, so the discipline didn't go away, but because uh, Jonathan, you could take anything away from him and he just adapted. He was like a, those little lizards running around. He just changed. Okay, I don't want to play with that anyway. I don't want to play with that anyway. So you had to find a way to discipline where with William, you just looked at him and said, I'm using names because these are my kids. They can, they can slap me later. But they, they, you look at William and just said, I'm disappointed. And just tears would start rolling down his face. He was completely different. But there was still structure and discipline. So even though, yes, there were differences in how we dealt with them, the parenting was the same. We had structure. We had rules. We had um, discipline in many forms. <laughs> we went to church. We, got, we fed them the word. So, I mean, I, the basic core things, it's like a recipe. Mm -hmm. The basic recipe might not change, but what you might add the pecans and the, maybe that's not a great, but you know what I mean. There's a core <laughs> recipe that doesn't change, that's gonna, still going to be a cookie, but you can make many different kinds of cookies. 
with the same basic technique. It's like chocolate chip. Uh, especially <laughs> chocolate chip. You can put nuts in them, but they're better with that. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with you on that. But, my, but you get it. I mean, the point is, we had to hear from God. Yes. The answer to that question is, you had to be led in different situations because what worked with one, and I only had two, what worked with one didn't work with the other. Um, but you didn't give up discipline because of that. You didn't give up going to church because they adapted differently. Exactly. Does that answer? Does that yes, the, what you were talking about? And so the reason that I'm saying that, hang on just one minute. I just thought about something. Uh, I like to put people on the spot. Y'all know, do y'all know that by now? Jordan and Jeremy and Jason, come up here just a minute, please. <laughs> Now, everybody knows that I have uh, been very vocal about public and, and homeschooling and this stand right over here so everybody can see. Jordan, you can have a seat in the chair and the boys can stand behind you just a second so you can sit, sweetheart. Um, I've been very, very vocal about, get her a microphone if we can do it, Rob, without, yeah, there you go. Jace has got one. He's a sound guy anyway, so. Um, very vocal about the difference between homeschool and public school. And um, I've made a lot of loud screams about this. I mean, I've screamed to the rafters about this stuff. But I want to tell you just the other side for just a moment. Um, it's not about homeschool or public school. It's about the person. Just exactly what he was just saying. It's about the person, and, and I'm going to explain it to you just a second with these three. Um, where, where's their mom and dad? Right back over there. Right back over there. Y'all stand up just a minute. They are just the best. I'm telling you what, they have raised some outstanding kids. I don't like a lot of people around me all the time. I don't know if you know that or not because I like to be quiet and I have to hear from God. And if you're around me, you will know, they know. I'm answering, she's seen it more lately, a thousand questions a minute. How often does my text ring on my telephone? Constant. It's just nonstop answering questions. And so uh, you guys can be seedy. Um, that's John and Jackie, I'm sorry. Um, and um, so I have to have peace around me constantly. So if you don't have peace when you're around me, then that's a problem for me. Well, Jordan is just full of peace. And, you know, you have to have somebody that if you correct them about something, instantly there's no bitterness. Instantly there's no animosity. Instantly there's no problem. Instantly it's, okay, we're good. Instantly there's no problem. As a matter of fact, I think I corrected you and you about something this week, didn't I? Teeny somethings. And you got off the hook. How in the world did that happen this week? <laughs> I'm telling you what. But these three, the reason I'm saying this is because these three have totally different personalities. Okay? This one and this one, homeschooling, zero problem. I'll tell you, I mean, she could do basically, if, if there's something she doesn't know how to do and I say, go do this, she says, I've never done it before, but if you'll show me, I'll, I'll learn it. That's her answer to everything I've ever told her to do. I don't think I've ever, I said, let's make gumbo today. Let's go in there and start this. And she's like, okay. And that was the end of it. She's never even heard of it probably before, you know, and she's ready to do it. Okay. And this one here, such discipline. How much weight did you lose? About 70 pounds. 70 pounds. Now, if you can lose 70 pounds, you can do just about anything, you know, <laughs> discipline. Okay. Anything. Okay. So, but this one here, when did you start working for me? How old were you? 16. Hadn't finished school. I think you had just barely finished when you started working for me. I hadn't finished school yet. So I found out he's not finished with his school. But not only is he not finished with his school, he ain't doing it. <laughs> and so I said, get on your schoolwork. He didn't do it. Get on your schoolwork. He didn't do it. So I said, bring your books. I'm going to pay you to do your schoolwork. So I'd send somebody out there and he'd check on him. Is he doing his, no, he's on his phone texting. So the next day I'd check on him. Is he doing his schoolwork? No, he's playing with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Is he doing his schoolwork? No, he's doing, doing this, you know. No schoolwork. So finally I had to tell him, ultimatum. 
No schoolwork, you're going home. You're not coming back until you get your schoolwork done. I mean, I was, I mean, I was hard nosed with him about it. Now these three kids are tops. I have them around me every single day of my life. Now I don't have a lot of people around me just about every single day of my life. They're tops, but they're totally different. And the reason that I'm telling you that is because not every child is gonna do the same thing. Their personalities are going to be totally different and the structure of their lives are gonna be different. Now these two, homeschooling, not a problem. That one there, he might have been better off with somebody standing over him in public school. And I know his mom and dad well enough to know that they're not gonna get offended at me or get put out with me or anything like that because even him, you could ask him now and I'll let you ask him, is he glad he finished school? Give him the microphone. I'm definitely, definitely glad. So what would you have thought had you have quit without finishing? Well, I mean, when you quit, you just have that mindset. So if you say, like, oh, I quit school, I don't have to do it, so you know, it's not a big deal. You kind of have that mindset developed so that you don't have to go do something else. You think, oh, I'm not, I quit before, I don't have to finish this. Exactly. And you just keep living like that. Exactly. But now, let me tell you this. I put him down for just a minute on the school stuff, but I want to flip the coin on that. A lot of days, I'll never forget the very first year he worked for me on my birthday. He gets me the funniest card and puts a gift card in it. He didn't forget. I get emojis from him sometimes that make me laugh so hard when I'm in the middle of something that has been so tough and so annoying and so everything and he makes me laugh. Different personalities. But what happens is People try to put people in a box that they're all exactly the same thing. And they try to make this child make straight A's. He's never going to, and I don't mean to be rude, but he's never going to make straight A's. He's a me. He and I are a lot alike. We are never going to make straight A's in school. We're going to be thankful to finish school. Like I told you before, I cheated off of Keith's test. <laughs> okay? This one here, st straight A's, straight A's. I didn't even ask her before, but I, I would have gathered straight A's. Straight A's, straight A's. But him and I, but because that's not our calling in life. But what parents do a lot of times, Dave, <laughs> straight A's? Yes. No. <laughs> no, not even close. Administrator, pastor. Do you see the difference in what I'm trying to get across to you? The Bible talks about fathers not provoking their children to wrath. And it doesn't say that a parent shouldn't encourage, just like what he was saying with his two boys, you still have guidelines and you still have rules. They, he still needed to finish school because he, you, you could use your, you don't know what the future brings. I just told him the other day I wanted him to take some classes on sound. He might need that high school diploma because anything I've put him to do, if he keeps his mind on it, he'll do you an excellent job. But sometimes he gets his mind on other things but so do I. If he keeps his mind on it, he'll do you an excellent job. But sometimes he gets his mind on other things because that's our personalities. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. His, always on the task. So you have to look at what your, who your children are and don't try to push a person that is not a studious person like this to make straight A's. If they're a talker and outgoing, they may be more of a doer than they are a studious person. And it provokes them to feeling like they're defeated every single day of their life. I know Keith would never, ever, ever, ever study for a test. I, he, he says he did, but I was there with him. He did not study. 
He didn't. I'm telling you, he didn't. And he'd be at my house and say, let's go to a movie or something. I'm thinking, we have a big test tomorrow. We have no movie tonight. No. And he makes an A and I make a D minus. <laughs> and I stayed home and studied and he went to the movie with Gerald. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't seem fair. But it's because our minds are wired differently. Our hearts are wired differently. And the reason I'm saying that is because I have parents all the time. He has parents. He has parents asking us, why do our children do so bad in school? It can be, it cannot be because they have ADD. It's not because of that. It cannot be because they are, are slow. It cannot be because they are, are dysfunctional or all the things the world tries to tell them. It can just be because their grace is not in that area. They just may have a different grace. Tell about your boys. How, one studious, one not studious. Well, okay? Well, it was Jonathan is. The oldest one is more of a, I mean, he doesn't have to study kind of person. But his, he is socially very, very active. Thank you, guys. I, yeah. I, I think I got my point across. Y'all understand. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Awesome kids, all of them. Best. Very different. But William is an applied student. He, has to, he studied and worked very hard. He made good grades, but he worked hard for them. Jonathan was more of the... I don't have to really, he didn't, he was, and I was sort of that way. He's more like me in that regard. I didn't, I didn't study for tests. I, it came very naturally. I'm not a, you know, it's not a pride thing. It's just how you're wired. And it came more naturally to him. William's a studier. He's studious and has the same values, but approaches it completely differently and had to approach it differently with him. With Jonathan, you could know, I didn't have to say, you have to finish this and stay home and do this. With William, I had to say, you got to test. You got to stay home and get this done. But he's, they've both grown up into fine young men. Yes, if I do have. say so myself. But let me ask you one more question before we go on to a totally different thing here. And um, um, I think this may surprise some of you. Parents have this idea, ideal maybe I should say, that they know absolutely everything about their kids. And that their kids are going to come to them and tell them everything. <laughs> well, now, especially when they're 12, 13, 14, they're still young. They're going to come to them before they're going to go to anyone else. We've heard it said how many, how many thousand times, how many thousand times? Yep. We've heard it said, so, oh, no, my kids would tell me. Oh, no, my kids would tell me. Oh, no, I know my kids better than that. They didn't oh, do that. They didn't do that. I know my kids better than that. They didn't do that. Or they would come to me and talk to me about that. I'm going to put both of these guys on the spot now again. They already know what I'm going to ask them. Was there things that your daughter didn't go to you about? Many. Many things. Was there things your son didn't go to, sons uh, didn't go to you about? Absolutely. What if they would not have had someone they trusted to go to? I wouldn't like that. I mean, I prayed for people, godly people in their lives that would give them God, you know, for Ramsey especially because I knew me and I would not just go. And, and I loved my mom. I mean, my mom was it for me, but there was things mom wasn't going to know about. Well, God put people in my life that would direct me. I prayed for that person, and it actually ended up being her. Uh, when Ramsey met her at eight years old, they became best friends. She's and, my daughter. Yeah, she, they're still best friends today. And so it was, a, you know, and it was a good match because that was the godly influence that when she wouldn't, you know, she'd say, if your daughter texted me last night. I'm like, great, that was the end of it because I didn't need to, need to know why. I knew she was getting good counsel. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't concerned about it. And same with you. Well, you, I, I'll just expound on that by saying as a parent, your, my response to that had everything to do with whether they were going to talk to me again. Mm -hmm. And that was, I was, I was kind of had to take the position of Dave. Immediately you think, why on earth would you tell them that? Why didn't you come to us? But my, then, that's flesh. And so as soon as your spirit took over, I had exactly the same response. Thank God they had somebody that they trusted and went to that was not in the world, that was a spiritual uh, word-grounded person that would give them God advice. 
And that's a thing to be very thankful for. But I think we, you and I just talked about this this week, if, if it's okay to expound yes. on that a little bit. Parents come to us all the time with a reaction to something. And I'm not going to name names, but they, maybe they found out their kids were doing drugs or were around drugs or were drinking or whatever it was, and they have completely melted down. And the parents are very upset about it, and they reacted to them. And my first reaction to that is they will never come to you with another thing because of how you reacted to that. Because as parents, if you have a complete meltdown because they came to you with something or because you found out about something, they're never going to come to you again because they love you. They, and, it's, and they don't want you to melt down. They don't want to see this upset side of you, not just because they feel bad, but because they love you. And as parents, we have to be able to say, you know what, what I started doing was, and you, this advice came from her, our kids, both of our older kids were in the youth group here, why so Mrs. Moore was in the middle of in that. Branson, in Branson, in Branson. The Branson. And so there was a, they had, the, they had a very tight group, and they still do, but yeah. it's just a different group now. But, but when the kids were, what I had to get to was that, the, that, he, that he had someone that to, would give him that advice. And as the future, I had to, when he would come to me with something, she said, you know, Think of what it could be. Maybe it would, could have been a police officer on the door, knocking on your door, instead of them sitting in your room telling you something that they did. Could have been that, that, that the law's involved. It could have been someone coming to say they'd been in an accident. It could have been a thousand different things that were much worse than this moment in time that they made a bad choice. And maybe it was a bad choice, and maybe we, and we, nobody, I don't, I've never heard you or you sugarcoat something with people and say, yeah, that's okay that you did that. But you have to get past it and say, okay, this happened. This, what are we gonna do about it? Exactly. What does the word say about it? Exactly. You're here, and they come to you because they expect to get the word. Or they come to me, or they come to Dave, or whoever it is, you want that person in their lives. But as parents, if you want them to come to you about anything, you better watch what you re, how you react because it's gonna matter. And this, if it's something this big, then when it's this big, there's no way they're, they're gonna hide it. And so we've gotta keep that door open, with the doors with other people, and praying and believing for godly people in their lives, and to keep the doors open with us, you need to react in a godly way, which is always gonna start with love. And grandparents. And grandparents. Yeah, for people that you know, maybe don't have kids in their house anymore, but your grandparents, you know, you're not just here by accident either, because grandparents are, a huge influence uh, and they are somebody that um, I know uh, my mom with my kids growing up they would spend hours together and I thought I can't have a better person than that spending hours with my kid and all of, all of her grandkids were like that and so if you're a grandparent that that is somebody another person that they might talk to instead of uh, the parents, literally, because grandparents sometimes are easier to talk to. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a little more sugary. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more sugary sometimes. Now, in talking with this, before we go into the transition with the kids, um, I think Dave says it all the time, and I know Tom knows it. The reason that um, I've been the way I have been about public school and homeschool is because... Um, it's this time of year again, and it's graduation time. And this is the time of year that this was happening with Jason, wherever he went. And it's the time of year where they should be around their peers. And they should be enjoying the things that their peers of their age would be enjoying this time of year. Like we here at the church, uh, for the graduating class, we plan some kind of function for them, you know, and here they'll do something. I don't remember what it is. And in Branson, they'll do something. And um, then, of course, Brother Moore and I will lay hands on them. And those are significant times to, I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's a very significant time for a youth, you know. And if you don't realize how important it is in their life, you should, because it's a very important time. And if they're coming up on these times and they're not finished with their schooling, it begins to, and I'm going to use this word very strongly, irritate the punk out of me. Because instead of parents coming down on their kids and saying, no, we're not going to make this easier on you. Get in your room and do whatever it takes to get that done. 
parents do what I call the pretend thing and the take up for the child thing instead of, if when I was a child I guess I learned this from my parents okay my mom and dad if I got in trouble in school and I've heard you say it I think I've heard you say it if I got in trouble in school not only did I get in trouble in school but when I got home <laughs> I got in trouble at home <laughs> and then I had to go back to the school and apologize to the teacher and apologize to the principal and apologize to whoever I got in trouble with. Man, it didn't go well for me that I got in trouble in school. No matter if the teacher was so far wrong out in left field, it did not make any difference whatsoever. It doesn't matter because that's an honor thing. They are your elders and it doesn't matter what they did. You were the one that was wrong. But today, society, the parents have taught their children, and not all of you, I'm sure, because all of your children and you wear halos and we should hand them out. <laughs> but have decided that our children can do no wrong and you're setting them up for failure. Because I have employees right now today that when you tell them to do something, they think they can cry and say, I'm sorry. And it's going to be okay, but they still don't have to do their job. They just go off and ha ha ha, ha but they still don't have to do their job. And they come back next week and you say, did you do it? And they go, I'm sorry. And then so the next week you check and see, did they do their job? And they go, I'm sorry. But they still don't do their job. So as a parent, you're setting your child up for failure in the world if you allow that to happen. If you allow them to cry and you not make them, literally make them, you are the parent. And the problem is, as a leader, take my word for it, it is not fun to fuss at Dave and Tom, but I have to sometimes. Ask them. <laughs> it's not fun to correct an employee or to say we're not doing it this way when they really want to do it that way. Because they are the best, I couldn't do it without them. I could not literally do nothing without the, them. But yet and still, if God says do it this way, we have to do it that way. That's right. And it should be that way in your house. If God says do it this way, I'm sorry, you can cry and pitch a fit all you want to pitch a fit, but we have to do it this way. And somebody has to be strong enough to be the head to do that. And it ain't the lady. Every guy in the place, stand up. This ain't marriage meeting. But I want you to understand, you are the head. And I don't give a rip what your wife says. If your child is not finishing their grade on time, it's your job as their father to make sure that their lessons are done and that they're graduating when they're supposed to be graduating. Because you are the head of the house. You, you don't, I mean, you don't let that go. You love them, but you do it in love. Do I love you? Yes. Do I love you? Absolutely. Dreadfully so. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't let it go because I want them to be all that God has called them to be. Amen. And I know every person in this room wants their children to be all that God has called them to be. You can be seated. And I'm not fussing at you, but I want you to understand. God gave you an anointing to make that happen. And he will give you wisdom in order to make it happen. He'll show you. Now, they don't have to make straight A's. Do you understand that? But they do need to finish. 
Because once a person doesn't finish something, they feel like they're a quitter. And if they quit that, then they're gonna quit the next thing, and they're gonna quit the next thing, and they're gonna quit the next thing, and it's just gonna be real easy to quit their next marriage, and it's gonna be real easy to quit their next job, and it's gonna be real easy to quit their next this and their next that, because I'm just a quitter. Don't set your children up for that. Be strong enough to not do that. How many toes did I just step on? Raise your hands up real high. It's okay, it's okay anyway. All right, so in saying that, the reason that I was getting to that is because the reason that people don't put their kids in public school is because of what? Fear, fear a lot. Fear. A lot of times. A lot of times, fear, fear. And so that's the next subject that I kind of want us to get into. And I had some questions for Dave in regards to it, and, and Tom too, um, but um, we had a, a thing years and years ago at the church. We had uh, a preach off. Uh-huh. Do you remember that? Yep. When I was doing youth and all the youth were preaching. They did an outstanding job. They would have just shocked you at how well they did. I mean, they could preach, some of them sounded just like Keith. I mean, they did just an amazing job. And um, so anyway, before we did it, we wanted to teach them properly how to get quiet before a service and how what to do. Because in some of their homes, they had several siblings and they had this and they had that. So we wanted to properly teach them what they were supposed to do and how to prepare before a service. So we were having the boys go one place and we were having the girls go another place to spend the night. Do you understand what I'm saying here, right? So all the girls were going to spend the night at Dave and Kim's house. There were no guys around. There was nobody else there. Dave was the only guy there. And Ramsey was there and all the others, and they were all sleeping downstairs, okay? Then the the guys were all going to Kevin and Susan's house. And the only girl there was Susan. You know who Kevin and Susan are, right? She sings in the choir, short red hair. Everybody knows Kevin and Susan. All right, so they were all going there. We actually had some parents to tell us, no, our 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds have never slept anywhere but in their own beds and they cannot go. See how quiet it got? That is really, really, really sad. Because what happens then is two months later, we have a job fair. It, did that not happen? Yep. Did you have to talk to the people? Yes. It happened. Two months later, we have a job fair there for the youth. And what happened? They, uh, they well, actually found out more than just that, but there were several that actually couldn't even, couldn't apply for a job. I mean, literally could not fill out an application properly, could not, uh, um, and I shouldn't say several. There were a few uh, that wouldn't, couldn't, you couldn't interview them. Um, they were not prepared because they had never done anything. They hadn't filled out an application. They'd never been in a business situation. And I mean, and we're, we were talking about 18-year-olds at this point. And so, I mean, there were, we had actual business people that came in and actually did this with them. They, they, they brought their own applications and. I mean, we had an electrician, we had, we had several different ones, but there was people, there were a few, and I won't say dress a lot. Dress shops, we, yeah, had, dress we just shops. had several things that but, were there to interview them for jobs. They literally could not interview. They, they did not have the skill, the people skills. They, they couldn't even talk to them because they were, they were, they were in fear. I mean, literally, they were afraid because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what a social security number was? No. They didn't know how to fill, they didn't know any of the information that they needed to put on an application. And you're looking at me like, well, what does that matter? Well, the Bible didn't call us to be stupid. We're supposed to be the smartest people in the world. We're supposed to be, it's, it, it talks about us being an example to the world and, and have a good rapport to those who are without, it talks about. It didn't say we're supposed to look to the world as being the dumbest people in the world. 
You know, it's not just us and the Bible. He, he never said that. Every skill that I have in order to do the jobs that I do today, the biggest majority of them, I have either gotten a degree in, or I've had to learn, or dear Lord, I don't know what I'd do without Shireen, without her accounting degree. And these are worldly tasks and stuff. Him and his graphic stuff, and, and Nate and his graphic stuff, and, and the guys that can run sound, and the guys that can run lights, and we would be in a world of hurt around here if we didn't have people that could do something. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that, that people cannot learn other things other than the Bible. Amen. It, it doesn't say that. But people have gotten it in their heads that we even have parents that this, I think this is one of, I have my pet peeve about homeschool and public school. Dave has a pet peeve, this is his pet peeve. I'm gonna tell it to you. When a parent tells their child they're punished, and go in their room and read their Bible. Yeah. 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 Go in your room and read your Bible, or you can't go to youth tonight. Or you can't go to youth tonight. <laughs> so you keep them away from church. You know, the very thing that can help them, they're pulling them out of, or they're using it to punish them in their room. And that's not going to help them. You, you don't use God as a tool to punish or, or whatever, you know. And so... These are things that, that we have seen a lot in church. And so we're trying to help you and the people out there watching on the internet all over the world and the people that are not in churches and people that have had issues with their children and, and people that have had issues at home. The world is a scary place. Granted, it is a scary place. But it's much more scary if you don't enter into it till you're 20 years old. That's right. It's much more scary if you have no dealings with it until you're 20 years old and you're thrust into the workplace and you have to deal with crazy people when you're 20 years old. I'm telling you, when, if you've had to deal with bullies from the time that you were three years old at nursery and they tried to take your toys and ch kick you in the chin and spit on you and bite you and, and everything else and you've learned how to deal with them from that time to now, well, you use your faith and you begin to learn how to deal with it and you put them in, in children's class and they teach them the scriptures on it and they teach them things on it and how to overcome these things instead of, well, they might get measles. Well, they might get, um, uh, have sex with somebody. Well, they might get this and they might get that. Well, listen, children, um, I'm gonna tell you a story. As soon as they can get away from you, they're gonna run as quickly as they ever can away from you. We've seen it too many times, you know, and it's, it's a sad thing because um, uh, kids love their parents. But I'm going to make a very bold statement here. And you can say, well, Mrs. Moore, you don't have kids. You can say however you want to say. You can say whatever you want to say. I don't, I don't write me all the letters you want to write me. I have great big trash cans. <laughs> and there's even some big dumpsters out back. But fear is fear. It'll be fear today, it'll be fear tomorrow, and it'll be fear next week. And if you don't know how to deal with things you're going to run across, then they're going to come on you. Something came up last week, and Dave and I were going to talk about it in just a minute. Um, And I was having to counsel with someone, and I hadn't thought about this in a long time. And Dave and I have spent, when we first started the church, just like with kids, with Tom, we learned by trial and error in things that we did and didn't do. I think in the beginning we did let a few kids go in the classrooms with their brothers and sisters. And I think we did do a few things that we, sure. we realized we shouldn't have done. But we learned by praying and getting straight with the Lord. Well, Dave and I, when we started the church... Um, we wound up having to counsel with some people. And we did a good bit of counseling. We would be, go through a whole week, we didn't have a lot of staff, and we'd go through a whole week and we'd be exhausted, and somebody after church on Sunday afternoon would want to counsel, and it would, we wouldn't get lunch, we'd end up staying after church, and it'd be four o'clock, five o'clock, some Sunday afternoons, before we'd ever even be able to get home. And we came to find out that, I asked him just the other day, 
I said, I looked him square in the eye and I said, Dave, of all those people that we counseled, how many marriages stayed together? None. Not one. Did you hear that? Not one. Now, which marriages did stay together? The ones that uh, did what we did, did it the way we should have done it in the first place. But the ones we, in, in our council, you know, we have people call all the time and say, do you have marriage counseling? And I say, absolutely. We have 16 of the best years of marriage counseling you could ever get. And we'll tell them, if you and your wife will go get this set of tapes, get three years of them, start with three years. Those are the people that and when they would get them, sit down together, watch them together, talk to each other about them and find their place. Those are the people that stayed together. And that, that's the best marriage counseling we've ever had. Because if the Word of God can't fix you, well, I'm sure not going to say anything that's going to fix you. <laughs> if God's saying it and you can't hear Him, you surely ain't going to hear Dave. But I actually was talking to a person the other day that the Lord put on my heart to talk to. Not because they asked for counseling, but the Lord put it on my heart to talk to them. Brought them up to me in the nighttime. And I, I just sensed that they were having some issues with some things because they're just such a loving person. And, and I thought, I got to deal with this. And it was somebody that was in public school. And I thought, yep, this is what's happening. And the Lord brought the whole scenario to me. And I think this will be of great benefit to you. And then Keith told us something at the end of it that neither of us had, had thought of. And so I'm going to kind of tell you the scenario of it. And... Um, when you're in public school, or you're in your job, or you're in the world, um, there are influences out there. How many of you have realized that? Absolutely. But in these counseling sessions that we were having, I had never realized how influenced some of these people were. And one day, we came out of this counseling session, we were dealing with this lady, and she had already had, I can't remember how many affairs, and she was back in there with us again. And I remember this to this day so distinctly, and I had never told it before. I had never really even thought about it before, but I remember it so distinctly. I hugged her neck, and I prayed with her, and I prayed for her to be free from all this stuff, and she, they, she left. But that weekend, I told Keith, I went to Keith. Now, some of you will think I'm Looney Tunes for this, but I did. I said, Keith, something's weird about me. I feel so flirty. Don't let me get around anybody that I can be around. Keep me in the back. Hide me. Oh, because I feel like anybody I come in contact with, I'm just going to flirt with them. And he said, Phil, do you remember you prayed with that lady the other day? And he said, um, did you cast a spirit out of her? And I said, yes. And he said, um, where'd you tell that spirit to go? I said, nowhere. <laughs> he said, you need to rebuke that spirit now off of you. It says, because when you cast out the spirit, it looks for someplace else to go immediately. Immediately, it looks for someplace else to go. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, get away from me, you know, and I did. I did just that and never a problem after that. But the reason that I'm bringing that up to you is I want to read you a quick story. One of y'all is probably a better reader than me, but I'll read it real quick. That the Lord reminded me of. I didn't read this in that session, but the Lord reminded me of something. And I think it'll help us here today. This is Brother Hagen in one of his books. And he tells this story. He says, I'm telling you the story of blank. And some of you've heard it and you know who it is, but I don't want to say tonight. And um, quite often he would use this illustration. He says, he said, um, this person was unable to stay with anything. He would not keep a job. He'd just quit and walk off. He'd not stay in one church. One time we'd see him uh, in the church leading the choir and everything would be just fine. And the next time we'd see him and he'd be out of church and he'd walk up to me and blow cigar smoke in my face. And he'd say just anything. He said, I just loved him, but I knew the devil had a hold of him. And he was like a roller coaster or a yo-yo Christian. Up one day and down the next, in and out. He said, um, 
One afternoon between services, I was in the Sunday school room praying about the, the night service. And I had grown tired of praying on my knees and I was lying flat on my back on the carpet, praying in other tongues. And suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to me about him and said, there are three demons following him around. He said, suddenly, um, he said, I had a quick spiritual vision and I saw him walking down the sidewalk and I saw three spirits following him that looked like little dogs would look following a person. Except they didn't look like a little dog, they looked like a little monkey. He said, uh, about the size and wiry, one was on the right edge of the sidewalk, one was on the left edge of the sidewalk, and one was in the middle. And the Spirit of God said to me, he will turn to the right and yield to the demon on the right, then he'll turn to the left and yield to the demon on the left, then he'll yield to the demon in the center. It seems at times that it's almost, a, a, he's, it seems at times that he's almost like a different person. Whatever demon that he's yielded to, he would act that way. Relatives would even remark, I don't understand, but it seems like he's schizophrenic. He said, he was a born again, spirit filled Christian. But just because you're filled with the Spirit does not mean that you're incapable of yielding to the devil. You still have a will of your own. You can yield to the devil and let the devil dominate you at any time you want. You can yield to the flesh and let the flesh dominate you any time you want. You can yield to the world and let the world dominate you any time you want. The Bible teaches us that you have to deal with the world and the flesh and the devil. But you do not have to yield to any of these. The Lord said to me, you speak to those spirits, command them in my name, in the name of Jesus, to desist in their maneuvers, command them to stop. And he said, I'm in Oklahoma, he's in Texas. And he said, in the spirit realm, there is no distance. And I said, tell me again what to do and I'll do just exactly that. And he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I command all three of you foul spirits following him around to desist, desist in your maneuvers and stop in your operations. And he said he sat up in his chair and he went on and he said he wrote all that down on a piece of paper that he'd have a job within 10 days. And he goes on to tell the story about how his life changed and uh, he started being a minister in a church and his life totally turned around. Well, the reason that I'm telling you this story is because I was ministering to this person, this young person in school. And um, he had been having some real difficulties with depression. And um, parents were concerned and I just knew it in my heart. And um, they had said something about it at one point and, and I thought, Lord, what is it? And he gave me the answer. This person is one of the most loving people you'll ever want to meet. And as I was sitting there, the Lord dropped it in my heart. He's constantly ministering to other kids. He's constantly loving on other kids at school. He's constantly, in the school system today, they have this new thing, you're supposed to love everybody, no matter what's, what's the deal with them. Whether they're gay, whether they're lesbian, whether they're depressed, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're, whatever the situation is. I mean, if you show any differentiation between them, it's an issue for you at school. It's, it's a problem. And this child would not do it anyway because he just loves everybody. But he would be more of the minister to these people. So in ministering to these people, I think he kind of did what I did. Do you understand what I'm saying? He opened himself up to that spirit of that. And the problem is because we have not taught our children that you can love, and Tom and I had this discussion one day, that you can love without opening your heart. The Bible didn't say open your heart, it said guard your heart. Guard your heart because out of it are the issues of life. But what they do is they open their heart wide open, which is exactly what the devil is trying to get them to do. 
and giving all their love out. The devil is tricking them into thinking, I have to open my heart to everyone and love everyone. And God never said that. You do love everyone, but you don't open your heart to everyone. You guard your heart and you resist the devil. So you have to minister to people in love, but you still have to guard your heart. And we haven't taught our church family and we haven't taught our children the difference in doing those things. So we have to learn it ourselves, how to be able to minister to people without opening our lives up to these things. That's why I think there's so much depression going on. Dave and I have talked about this with sickness and stuff. That, that so many people, they minister to people with sickness and then that fear, that spirit of fear that that sickness, it, it starts bombarding their minds. Yeah. We were talking about it the other day about people that minister to people about sickness and, and then that's all they can think about. They've been dealing with them for six months or a year and then that spirit of fear for that sickness coming on them comes to them because they've opened the door up to that to them. And we've got to learn how to be able to minister to people in love because that's who we are. We're, we're a people of love, but we can't open our hearts up to them. We've got to keep our hearts guarded and not let the devil in. So that when the thought comes, you are, okay, I'm gonna use a real um, vivid illustration for you because I think you will understand this one the very best. Okay, I don't know of a better one to use. And if it offends somebody, I apologize in advance. Okay, you minister to a gay or a lesbian person because you love them, because we do love them. And immediately you begin to have feelings of, I'm gay, I'm lesbian. I feel completely that way. That's who I am. I am, that's, that's who I am. And the feelings are real. They are 100% real because spirits are real and they can give you any kind of feeling that they want to give you. And I had not thought about it this way. I'm about to prove it to you because my husband is a very smart man. When we told him this story, Dave was there. I told him this story after church, we were going to the airport and he said this, he said, Phil, you ever seen suicidal pigs before? I said, no. Anybody in here ever seen suicidal pigs before? Pigs that just kill themselves instantly. Anybody? I said, no. He said, well, how come when Jesus got out of the boat with that man from the Gadarenes, they begged him to let the spirits go into the pigs and those sane, happy little pigs immediately committed suicide. Because that was a suicidal spirit. He was cutting, he was trying to kill himself. He was doing everything he could to do it. And immediately those spirits went into those pigs and they had that feeling that they had to kill themselves. And that is what is happening with our society. Amen. It's we're ministering to people or we're doing things or people are loving people and they're getting around people and they're thinking, I am that, I am this, I am suicidal. Our teens, I, I'm, I'm a cutter because they're hanging around friends that are cutters. I'm, I'm depressed because they're hanging around friends that are depressed. I'm gay because I'm hanging around friends that are gay. I'm, I'm sick because I'm hanging around friends that are sick all the time. Do you understand what I'm saying about this? We have to guard our hearts with this. So, so the answer, of course, a lot of parents would go back to this. Well, yeah, see, it's best to keep my kid away from that. Well, you can't do that. That, that's not possible. At some point in their life, they're going to get around it. Um, Ramsey, well, of course, we're in Branson. Well, that's not a big problem in Branson schools at this time. But after she got out of Branson school, 
she went to college and she's in athletic training. She's a certified athletic trainer. Well, that is very prevalent in that, in that uh, whatever field. you call it, field, yeah. And so, you know, one day I was actually talking to Brother Moore about it. And, um, and, 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 he, and he stopped me, he said, hey, there's spirits behind that. And this, was, this has been when she, back when she was in college. He said, there's spirits behind that. And he said, she's got to watch it. You know, this is the field she wanted to go in, and it's the right field for her. It's, it, and she's the, and, amazing. And, the, and, that's, and that's what I'm saying. You can't keep a light out of the darkness. You have to make sure the light's ready to go into the darkness. Right. And, and so he stopped me right then, and he prayed with me. And he said, let's pray a prayer. And, what it, and immediately it turned. She ended up in a church with other friends that, that got her away from not, she didn't get, she still ministers to those people, but she doesn't spend her whole life with them. And, 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 and so she's, and he, he turned it to a place where she became the minister and only at the time she was able to do it and, and her heart was guarded. And, and it immediately turned that situation, but it was a recognition that there's spirits behind that stuff. And, and if, you're, if your kids are in home school, if they're in public school, you, you know, wherever you got the Lord leads you to have them, it doesn't matter. You need to make sure they're prepared to be where they're at and realize there are spirits behind the things they're dealing with. And they're dealing, just like you go to work every day and you deal with people that have problems, at school there's people that have problems. And they're dealing with those things every day. And so when they come home and they say, and you say, how was your day? And they say, oh, it was a rough day. You don't say, oh, you're just going to school. It's not hard. You know what? They probably had a rough day because your light went into the world and other things came against it. And it's time to stop and pray for them and say, Lord, we cast out anything that tried to come against them in the name of Jesus. And we, we ask for your help and your strength. To, to take them into the right places in front of the right people and do the right things. And, and then you teach them to guard that heart so that, the, so, that the, so that those things that are coming against them cannot because out of them are flowing the true issues of life, the true things that are going to help those people. Because our kids in this church, in Branson Church, people watching on, they're lights to this world. We're not hiding them under a bushel. We're going to prepare them. So the, the key to that is to prepare them. And, and that day, I'll never forget it, because he, we were right there in the driveway. I had taken him something, and we were just talking. I didn't even mean to talk about it. And he said, stop, right there. And, he, and, he, and it, you know, when Brother Moore says stop, it's time to stop, because the Lord just gave him something. And it turned a situation to where, and, and I'm not, see, I didn't even see it. Again, God put somebody else in Ramsey's life because I didn't see it. I, I, I knew she was ministering to these people, but I didn't see the danger. And see, as parents, listen to the people he puts around you and over you. Be submissive to what, what if I'd have said, she's fine, Brother Moore. But instead I listened and, he, and, and I immediately saw God work in that situation. And it was amazing the things that, and the things she's doing now serving in the church and still good friends with some of these people and able to minister to them at the same time. And so it, it turned a corner and took a spiritual attack mm -hmm. out of the way. Mm -hmm. So that's why the importance of, what is the importance then, Tom, of getting the kids in church and then in the right places where they're supposed to be? Well, you're setting them up for success. Yeah. You're yeah. setting them up. And, and, and the reason why I believe it has to start so young and what we've seen over the years is it puts you in a place to have that circle of influence. If they don't ever run into any of these things until they're 20 and in college, they're, guess what? You're not their circle of influence anymore. There's other circles out there. And so we deal with this stuff, you know, maybe not on these levels, but in the beginnings of these. Mm -hmm. And we always, and we've talked to the teachers about it. We talked to parents about it. You're teaching these kids how you allow them to relate to you. When, we're, when our children are little, we are God-like figure to them. We aren't God, but that's who we're representing to them. We're teaching them about the things of God. And if they're gonna talk back to you, they're gonna talk back to God when they're 18. And it was real simple for me as a parent when I finally came to the realization that, you know what, this isn't about being disrespectful to me. This, I, I could handle that today. What I don't want is for them to be disrespectful to God when He comes to them about something. 
because that's exactly what we're doing. It's not about the education. It's, it, of course our children need to be educated. Of course they need to learn things. It's about teaching them to relate to God. And if they can't relate to people, how do they do the Great Commission? How do you go and, and teach and tell the good news if you can't talk to somebody? So that's the challenges that I see. But I believe it starts when they're young and teach them up in the, in the fear and admonition of the Lord uh, not provoking them to wrath, but teaching them because it isn't okay to talk to God like that now. But that's what made this with Ramsey so easy. Ramsey grew up in the Faith Life Church right. kids. She started as an eight-year-old in Faith Life Church kids, then worked in Faith Life Church kids as a teenager. And so, I mean, she, she was always, and so she had that base. So the minute that prayer was out there, she, she's already got that same foundation exactly. from the very person that God worked through to put that fact. Because remember what Mrs. Moore said in the, in the beginning, what we teach in the kids, what the, the curriculum in the kids is the messages that God gives Brother Moore. Yes. And they're just put into kid portions, if you will. Exactly. And, and so she had a foundation to where this could immediately be received. It's like whenever she, if she still this day, she would call Miss Phyllis. If, if, she, if it was something she felt like needed to go beyond. She just recently it's over day. Yeah. And and so did his son about yeah. something. Yeah. And, and they're both grown and, and married. Well, he's married and she was almost married just recently. And, and so, but the, life is... <laughs> Wrong guy. <laughs> he prays too hard. <laughs> no, I'm ready for you. Man. Yeah. He just... <laughs> right guy. Right, right guy. Right guy. But so you might ask, you might ask this question, you know, what if, what if that, I let that go too far? What if there are spirits already involved? Don't, the problem that you have now is do not take things out on your child. It's like we deal, and I'm gonna bluntly say some things and listen to me carefully. I'm looking at the camera. Uh, this is not your child. These are people that have already gone. You don't even, you wouldn't know them if I called their names, you know? So uh, uh, that we've had issues with, with pornography. We've had to go to the schools. We've had to deal with issues with, with serious issues. But these kids have turned around and become really good kids. But the parents were going ballistic over it because they were trying to deal with the child instead of dealing with the spirit behind it. That's it. That's it. Do you understand what I'm telling you? We deal with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. And parents can only see the issue, the child there that is looking at the porn or the child there that's lying to them. You don't know who they came in contact with and maybe the child that was their best friend had a lying spirit. And maybe your child started lying to you every single day. And you're like, what happened? You never used to lie to me and you and them are at every single day battling each other. Stop it. Stop that. Quit going to war with your children. They need to know they can come to you instead of being at war with you. You need to do some praying and you need to do some talking to the Lord and do what Brother Hagen did. This was someone that he had authority in their life, in her, their family. He, the Lord gave him a right to do something in their lives. And within 10 days, the whole situation had turned around because he dealt with it in the spirit instead of screaming and yelling and dealing with it in the natural. We've become too natural with things in our lives. And if you're having problems with things in your home, it's because a door has been opened somewhere and someone has yielded to something that they shouldn't be yielding to. We've been dealing with a child recently that has got into some trouble about some things. And the parents have got to learn, they've got to deal with things in the spiritual realm and not just the natural realm and be combative with that child. You, you've got to learn that if you're combative, the adult has got to be the adult and you should never become combative with a child. If you're secure in your place, I don't ever become combative with my employees. You may say, Mrs. Moore, you don't have any children. You don't understand. I have a hundred of them. Even more than that. 
<laughs> yeah, more than that, Dave says, because well, we have. She's just been talking about all the parenting she did tonight. I mean, mm -hmm. you think about it, all these things that we deal with, some, some, that's parenting. I mean, I, I did these things on a small level with my child, and the, but, but we, we do them on a big level in, other, in people's lives. And, and it's a good thing because, you know, while not every person we marriage counsel in the beginning made it through, we've talked to people who God said talk to and asked them to do things, and they, and they did them because they truly wanted things better, and they are still together. They those are. People are those, we've got people that, that are all over both churches that are thriving. And so, I mean, there, there is answers, but it's what she said. She do, we don't talk to anybody. I have people come to me all the time and say, I want to talk to Mrs. Moore. I'm like, well, if God gives her something, she'll talk to you. Because, again, without God's answer, it's not an answer. And so it's not going to do any good. But when people come and they truly want help, God always gives a word, whether he gives it to Brother Moore or her or even me or Tom at that time. It's always a word because they came with a sincere heart. And then you can deal with a spiritual matter because it was a spiritual matter. Now you have the word of God to fix it. Exactly. You're, not trying to fi you're not trying to say, well, just stop doing that. Well, they can't right. because it's a spirit. They can't stop doing it. And so when, when, when God gives her a word or, or me, but if he gives it to her or Brother Moore, when they give it to me to give to somebody, I, I write it down. Because it's a, word, it's a word from God. It's not a word. And so we, need to we take it real serious. But every time it's been something that if the people listened and carried it out. And it may have been something so simple they wouldn't even imagine. Some of these things that God has told her to tell me to do. And I'm like, what? I mean, in my mind I'm thinking, oh, I've got to add to that because it's just too small. I'm like, wait, no, I can't add to it. They're so simple. But the minute the people did them, they said, yep. And they did them. And you could see they hooked, they grabbed it the minute you told them. And the minute they did it, it was like that and they were fixed. And they never dealt with it again. And those are the things that are spiritually fixed. And, the, and those are the things that you're looking for in your children, your teenagers. You're, you're looking to find those answers. And sometimes you got to just take time and pray. And there's other times you need to sit there with your child and listen. Oh, yeah. And listen and listen and then when you're done listening, listen. And what happens, they'll correct themselves. They will literally turn that, because the kids here have the Word of God in them. And if you'll let them talk long enough, they know what's right and wrong. They know what God's telling them to do. And they'll bring it around. They'll say, I should just do this. And then you say, yeah, you got it. And now they heard from God. Their life just changed. They heard from God. And if, if, I could, if I could have just poured something into my child when she was young is the ability to hear from God. And, and as she grew and, and she's able to hear from God, that's when it, it's when they actually hear that they say, wait a second, I just got it. That's it. I got it. That's it. And their whole life's different from them. Now they have a relationship with the very one that you've hope, been hoping them to have one. That's it. And spiritual things become spiritual. That's, that's the most vital thing. I don't know if we've helped anybody tonight. You got anything else you want to share? I, uh, but this has been very strong on our hearts for a while, you know. And uh, we think our families are the most valuable, precious thing that we have, you know. And um, we don't want to lose any of them. And you, as the head of your families, have authority that we have to take a step up and start taking and using that authority in our households and, and not yield to our flesh, to the carnal nature as the world does to deal with situations. We've got to deal with it this way, his way. And don't just see the natural side of what's going on in your household and say, I have to correct them about this this way. Yes, you do have to discipline. You do have to say some things. You do have to deal with some things. but. There's a time and a place and a way of dealing with it. And you just have to get to the Lord and find out with the different children. And I know you know all this. And, and, but sometimes just an encouragement or a different way of hearing something or a different way of saying something can help set you on a different course and a different direction. So was anybody helped in any way in here tonight? Yes. Well, we might get to do it again. Guys, y'all want, or y'all, they're already there. Um, um, y'all, you got anything else you want to say? 
nothing else you want to say, then we'll call it a, a sing a song and then um, one of y'all can dismiss us and we'll be calling it a night then.